Hi again guys, so um, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, making a, uh, a quick video today about um, the history of Japanese swords. Now, um, anyone who's uh, who's come along to my um, different workshops uh, or just chatted to me generally about history will be well aware that um, I'm very much into Japanese history and the history of the samurai. Um, and anyone who's, uh, who's become good friends with me and come over to my house before will probably know that I have quite a lot of Japanese swords as well. Um, I've trained to use them before, a um, long time ago when I was a teenager, and now with, uh, uh, with the Order of the Blade, um, who is the, uh, the, the local Leicester-based um, uh, swordsmanship academy that I go to. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so I've always just had a, a, a real passion for Japanese swords. It's always been um, something that I'm very interested in. Um, so yeah, let's just have a quick, quick talk about them. So when um, we talk about Japanese swords, um, it's worth mentioning that uh, just off the off bat that not every sword that we talk about is what's known as a katana. So to talk about the history of it, we need to kind of go right back to the beginning, and we're talking about um, uh, the sort of like um, pre-samurai period of of Japanese history. Now, the early warriors of Japan were not the samurai. Um, I'll go into. Uh, uh, detail about that in, in a little bit um, and instead of using the curved sword that uh, the Japanese warriors are more sort of like um, associated with typically they actually had a single-edged uh, straight straight sword so it would have been kind of similar to um, some of these sort of uh, uh, single-edged Viking swords that you get um, but obviously um, based on on Chinese swords um, instead of instead of European ones obviously um, now these are very rare. They don't survive very well at all. Um, I'll see if I can post uh, some some pictures of some of them in the uh, in the comments below. Just a link to some of them. But basically, it's, it's kind of difficult to know where these come from. Probably from mainland China, but possibly from Korea as well. Um, but again, it's it's difficult to say. But once the Japanese started encountering um, other uh, uh, peoples on the islands of Japan. Um, it became evident that these types of swords were not particularly good, <laughs> basically. The design wasn't very good, um, uh, and they weren't very effective for what they were trying to do, and particularly when they ran into the Imishi people. Um, legend has it that the Imishi people, who are um, possibly ancestors of the modern-day Ainu people, um, who are sort of aboriginals of, of the Japanese islands, um, and unlike the... Um, uh, the Japanese uh, people, they can grow thick, full beards, um, and and actually are described often as having sort of um, looking similar to sort of like Aboriginal Australians, for example. So there might be uh, a um, uh, an ancestral link there. We don't know. It's hard to say. There's been a lot of research done into it, though. Um, but these people were uh, uh, horse archers predominantly. And they were also experts in using a type of curved blade, which probably came from mainland Asia, um, which was very, very good at uh, slicing through um, the poorly armoured enemies, uh, warriors that they were fighting, who were fighting for the Japanese uh, at the time. And they quickly adopted these these blades. Um, and that is basically where the Tachi, which is the original um, curved Japanese sword, comes from. Uh, sorry, was um, the the tachi is basically a very very long sword, um, similar looks similar to a katana on first glance, but does have some differences. It's very very steeply curved, for example, uh, and it's longer too. It's it's not super super long. Um, you know, we're not talking something like the length of a of a German Zweihander or anything like that, but it is definitely longer than uh, than um, other Japanese swords of a later period, and. The key difference, really, um, without going too technical on the sort of like geometry of the sword uh, between the the tachi and the more famous uh, katana, is that katana is worn blade up on the belt. So I actually have um, a katana here with me to show you. So with a katana, <clears throat> as it's hanging from your belt, it's blade up like that, whereas a tachi. And it's thrust through the belt that you're wearing as well, the, the uh, Sarashi belt that you're wearing. Um, whereas Atachi would be blade down, like this, and it would actually be fastened to your belt with um, 
the, uh, the, the sagio here. So that's actually the easiest way to tell on a glance without actually having um, a Tachi and a Katana next to each other for reference. Now, this weapon would have been used um, predominantly as a backup weapon in reality, because after seeing the way that the Amishi people fought and how successful they were in their horse archer endeavours against the Japanese, um, they the Japanese warriors basically adopted this style of fighting. This is pretty much what the samurai became uh, um, in their early period, as mounted archers. So the misconception about samurai is that they were always uh, swordsmen as their main weapon. But originally they were actually mounted archers. <clears throat> now samurai rose up um, uh, during the Heian period, which I mentioned before in a previous video, it was about sort of like 8th to 13th century Japan, roughly. Uh, maybe a little bit, you know, leeway either way. Um, but um, the samurai were originally actually sort of like really, really low-ranking um, nobility. And they were kind of like a, a, a administrative class, bizarrely enough, within the imperial court. Uh, and their job was predominantly to, to look over uh, the administration of the provinces that are further away from the capital, particularly in the far north where the Amishi people were still basically fighting a guerrilla war against uh, against the Japanese um, uh, invading force, effectively. Uh, <clears throat> but as the, the imperial court became more and more obsessed with art and culture and not really caring about running the country anymore... Um, local uh, uh, noblemen instead turned to the samurai to protect them. And this is where the rise to prominence of samurai as warriors came from. And so, again, originally mounted archers, the technique was basically to ride after their en uh, ride down their enemies, ride past them, and then shoot behind them into the back of the armour. Um, and the sword would only be drawn as a backup in case they ran out of arrows, or if they got attacked in close combat. Now, Again, big long swords make sense when you're on horseback, so you can get a nice big sweeping action downwards. Um, and this worked very, very well. Um, whilst the samurai were fighting themselves, which they would want to do very often, um, so it was, this was predominantly the style of fighting that was done during the, the famous Genpei War, for example. Um, but a big change came when the Mongols invaded in the 14th century, and basically. The problems that arose there when they were fighting the Mongols is that they quickly realised that the Mongol recurve bow was significantly more powerful than the Japanese Yumi bow um, that had been made up to that point because it hadn't changed the Yumi very much from its early conception all the way through to this period. And so they, at range, which was where they were typically used to fighting, they uh, were completely hammered by the Mongols on the beaches of uh, Kyushu. Uh, which is a southern island in Japan, the largest southernmost island of Japan. Um, yeah, it, it didn't go very well for them at all. Uh, and when they actually went on to fight them on the battlefield in, in close quarters, the Japanese samurai uh, were still attempting to fight in the old-style way, which was to go up to a person who they thought looked like a, a worthy warrior, call out their name, and demand a sort of one-on-one -on -one honor duel, at which point the Mongols would simply turn around and stab him to death with 30 different people because they didn't care about things like that at all. That was how they managed to conquer the largest contiguous empire in human history was by basically ignoring anyone else's sort of like codes of war and just doing things their way. So it looked pretty bleak for the Japanese and for the samurai um, until uh, it got to the point where the Mongols basically decided to return to their ships um, because they were taking some, they couldn't actually get a foothold on the beach, and the samurai, although not not doing particularly well, were managing to keep them controlled on the beach, and they simply couldn't set up a camp on the beach. So they returned to their ships, and at this point, the samurai basically decided that they were going to take matters into their own hands. They boarded small rowboats, rowed out to the, to the Mongol ships, boarded them, and started fighting them in close quarters with their their swords. And at this point, this is when the realisation came in that they may not have been better with their bows than the Mongols, but they were a lot better with their swords. Because the Japanese samurai obviously were a noble class and they had plenty of time to practice with their with all of their weapons and their swords. Whereas with a lot of the Mongols, their kind of um, 
they were conscripted soldiers, so they were decent in, in large ranks, but once you got them one-on-one, -on -one, they were not as effective as, as the samurai. And it they scared the bejeebas out of the out of the Mongols when they suddenly turned around and saw that loads of their ships were being massacred and set alight. Um, so they basically drifted out to, to sea to try and get away from these small rowboats that, that they thought couldn't follow them into open water. And that's when the monsoon hit, uh, the typhoon, sorry, the kamikaze, hit the uh, Mongol fleet and destroyed it. Now, um, this kind of was a proof of concept for the samurai, and realising that uh, maybe close quarters weapons might have been the better way to go, especially if the Mongols were planning on invading again. But they actually found, when they were on the Mongol ships, that their long, thin, touchy blades were actually getting stuck in the masts of uh, the Mongol ships and breaking, because they were so fragile. Um, just a quick side point as well, though, that on the actual beachfront, um, the rather than the katana, which was obviously quite sorry, the, the sorry the tachi, which was obviously relatively short, um, the samurai started using the naginata, which is basically a pole arm with a curved blade at the end of it um, as their main weapon. But in the close quarters of the ships, that's where the sword came into its own. But there was a realization that they needed to change the design of the tachi so that it could it could be stronger and fit its design as a close co combat weapon. Uh, combat uh, weapon a lot better than it than it already did, and so a decision was made to start smithing swords in the uchigatana style, which is basically the same as as the later katana. Um, the only real difference is is that the uchigatana was still carried um, blade down sometimes um, because it was still used as as a cavalry sword, whereas the katana, like I say, was was a little bit stouter and stockier as a blade. Um, but if we want to have a quick look at uh, a katana, we have one here. This is um, the uh, 47 Ronin Katana by Hanway um, Swords. Um, it's a very, very nice sword. Um, once again, depicting the uh, the 47 Ronin on uh, on the super, which is the handguard. Again, might make a video about them later on. But you can actually see that despite being a two-handed sword, the katana is quite short. Uh, which is unusual. So it's more akin to what in the West we might refer to as a bastard sword. Um, so effectively a one-handed blade with a two-handed grip. Now obviously this, this provides a lot of strength and power, um, but it does limit its reach somewhat. But that is basically um, predominantly a technicality um, overcome. So you can see that the, that the back of the blade is quite thick, whilst the edge is obviously razor sharp. Now Everybody always calls this groove here a blood groove. Anyone who's come along to my workshops before knows that that's not what it is. It is a bohi, uh, and it is not used to let the blood pour out um, like everyone thinks it is. It is actually used uh, to lighten the weight of the blade without compromising its, its structural integrity. And it's the same as a fuller on a European sword. The blood groove is a myth. It's not actually a thing, unfortunately. I don't know where that myth comes from, but that is what it's for. It's to reduce weight, not to let the blood flow out. So once they, oh, my apologies, once they, um, they shortened the blade, uh, it, it retained its, its, its presence as a backup weapon on the, on the battlefield, um, but it became a lot more effective at fighting enemies in armour um, because obviously it was less inclined to break because it was uh, shortened and, and made more stout and stocky. Additionally, uh, a lamination system was, was used to, um, to create the swords, which basically meant they had a soft core of steel at the back, which added flexibility, and a hard edge of steel at the edge, which meant that, meant that it retained a sharp edge very, very well. Um, still a backup weapon. The Naginata was still the mainstay weapon of, of, um, of the, the samurai on the battlefield until later in this sort of Sengoku Jidai where the um, Yari, which is the Japanese spear, started to replace it and then of course later the, the tepo, the, the gun, um, replaced it as the main weapon mixed with the Yari, just like pike and shot uh, warfare. So it did retain its, its nature as um, predominantly a backup weapon, um, but it did have a certain mystique to it, um, a sort of romanticism um, that, uh, that swords tend to have, and that is predominantly because of the fact that it is, it is a very expensive weapon. Um, to have made for you. Um, another thing that's worth noting about the katana as it developed from the uchi katana 
is that the blade actually became straighter and straighter. So it started to lose some of the really steep curvature that the Tachi sword had and starts to move towards being a more straight um, single edge blade. Now it's still curved, as you can see. But if you, um, if I find some pictures of Atachi and put it in the uh, in the comments for you, um, you will basically see just how curved Atachis actually are in comparison. Um, they, they also had a paired single-handed blade known as a Wakazashi, which you can see is a lot shorter. Um, it's it's about the same length as a Gladius, a Roman Gladius. Now. Typically, the idea of this weapon, um, a lot of samurai simply treated it as more like a ceremonial thing. That they had to have the two swords. That was the way that things were done. Um, but, obviously, some samurai, particularly such as Miyamoto Musashi, uh, probably the most famous samurai ever, actually saw this as a weapon that could be used in, in battle. Um, my sword master, Richard Hughes, he basically talked about the way that Miyamoto Musashi described um, his sword fighting style was very much in the kind of um, you use every tool available to you, you know so to, to simply treat this as a ceremonial sword that you never draw um, is to deliberately hamstring yourself on the battlefield um, there are depictions of him actually using both swords at the same time and indeed there are some sword schools I've, I've done a bit of research into it there are some sword schools um, dedicated to um, uh, the teachings of Miyamoto Musashi where they do instruct in the use of both swords one in each hand but typically um, it's more likely that Miyamoto Musashi was largely referring to the idea of um, using all options available to him. it's definitely the case that he did come up with some two sword fighting techniques because they, they still survive but it is also again worth pointing out that this is probably more, rather than him describing this as like the ultimate technique or anything like that, it was probably more a case of this is something you can do if you have to do it, and this is how you do it, effectively. Um, rather than basically just being like, this is how you should fight with swords. You know, two hand, two swords in one in each hand, that's that's the way it's got to be done, is probably more like, no, you can do that, and this is how, if you need to, <laughs> as it were. Now... The katana, again, sort of like remained more of a backup weapon throughout most of what we refer to as the Sengoku Jidai, which is 16th century Japan, the Warring States period. Um, but it didn't actually really become sort of like the main weapon of the samurai until what we call the Edo period, which um, started in the, at about 1603 in Japan, which is when the Tokugawa shogunate um, took over uh, the government of Japan. Um, and... From that point onwards, it was what we consider a, a period of peace. Um, as I mentioned in my previous video about ukiyo-e, that wasn't 100% true. Um, but it meant that samurai, uh, an entire class of, 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 uh, of society, the samurai, who were dedicated to warfare and their entire identity was built around fighting, um, suddenly had absolutely no um, wars to fight. Now, that's actually quite a problem. Because obviously, you know, you can give those those warriors uh, other purposes. You can give them administrative um, jobs. You can give them jobs in governance, and that's what they actually did. But you t kind of take away their pride when you relegate them effectively to being um, office clerks. And so it was quickly realised that the samurai needed some kind of way to bring their pride back as warriors. And so um, the the idea of Bushido, um, the, the, the art of the warrior or the way of the warrior, um, was codified for the first time and actually written down. And this gave the samurai sort of like a, a framework on how they should live, um, as well as giving them um, a bit of their pride back as well. But one of the big emphases um, in the Bushido Code was the sword, which had never been before. And now all of a sudden it was treated as actually the mainstay weapon of the samurai, which is a big shift from where it was before. Um, which kind of makes sense in a way, because as you mentioned, it is the, one of the most expensive weapons that you can get on the battlefield. There's a lot of steel in there and it takes a lot of skill to produce. Um, so it has that kind of um, that prestige factor to it. But also it makes sense... The fact that this was the first time that the sword had become the mainstay weapon. 
because it was the first time that a weapon could be chosen to be the mainstay weapon of a samurai, not based on its practical use on the battlefield, but rather because of its um, prestige status instead. So, the um, uh, samurai culture of the Edo period really, really focused in on uh, on swordsmanship and sword combat above just about every other um, form of, of combat. Um, and the idea of sort of like, you know, that, that one cut um, fight, you know, being able to end the fight in a single cut became a real sort of like mark of pride for the samurai as well. Um, so it's kind of interesting that um, our sort of modern perception of samurai is that they've always been these these incredible swordsmen um, and, you know, the sword is their soul and, and that kind of thing. Um, and that's like this several hundred, if not a thousand year old um, uh, tradition that dates back to, you know, ancient times. Whereas in reality, um, for a start, the samurai aren't even actually what we call an ancient um, uh group of people they actually date back to originally to the to the middle ages which is not ancient um it's medieval um and also the fact that until the time when the samurai weren't fighting anymore the sword was not their main weapon um it went originally it was bows on horseback then it was the naginata which is a type of pole arm and then it was the spear and then it was uh, the spear with the rifle and then it was the sword purely as because of ceremonial purposes so it's interesting how, you know, that, that sort of Edo period mindset of what a samurai should be has come to dominate um, our perception of, of samurai in general. Um, and that I find that really, really fascinating, to be honest, because it's almost like a, a propaganda um, program, effectively, uh, has had a, a wide-reaching impact on our um, public consciousness of an entire group of people, um, hundreds of years after that, uh, that that sort of propaganda um, idea was first put into place in a country, you know, several thousand miles away from us. Um, it's really, really interesting. Um, but anyway, the video is getting quite long now, so I'm probably going to uh, to wrap it up there. Um, but yeah, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this this look into the history of um, the, the samurai sword. Um, and yeah, I thought I'd go a little bit more into the history of it rather than necessarily how it's used. And I hope that was interesting to you guys. Um, like I say, or as always, leave any suggestions in the comments below um, as to future videos you'd like me to make. Um, and yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Stay safe. Keep washing your hands and stay indoors if you can. Thanks, guys.